So thank you for joining us for a Buckeye Bridge Series event. Today we are speaking with Ohio State students, Ohio State University students who have participated in study abroad along with international students currently studying at Ohio State. We also have students planning to participate in an exchange program either at Ohio State or abroad in 2021. We are hoping that today's discussion will spark your interest in engaging in the international opportunities that Ohio State has to offer. We'll start with um, introductions. And so I'll, I'll call on you in the order you're on my screen so we don't just all talk on top of each other. But if you can start by introducing yourself, telling us your name, where you're from, your home university, um, and what you're studying. So um, Michaela, you are first on my screen. Okay, hi everyone. I'm Michaela, uh, Michaela Dink. I'm from Germany and I used to study at the University of Regensburg, uh, which is in Bavaria, about one and a half hours from Munich, for those of you who are familiar with Germany. And um, I am getting my PhD in higher education and student affairs here at The Ohio State University. Uh, Canon. Hi, I'm Canon Kubota. I'm from Japan. Um, my home university is Waseda University in Tokyo. And I'm majoring in human science in Japan. And yeah, uh, it's um, half past 11 now in Japan. Great. Uh, Linda. Um, hi everyone, my name is Linda Capito. I come from Ecuador in South America. My home university is a National Polytechnic School. It's a public technical university in my country. And uh, I come from Quito, which is the capital of Ecuador. Uh, here I came to study my master's in electrical engineering. And right now I am in the second year of my PhD. Uh, Goran. Yeah, hi everyone, thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Goran, I'm a current full writer at The Ohio State University, so currently I'm situated in Columbus. Um, I am originally from North Macedonia, which is where I was born, grew up, and, and got my, my initial education. So um, I come from the um, St. Cyril and Methodius University, which is located in Skopje, Macedonia, from the School of Medicine. Um, I got my MD from there. And uh, currently at the Ohio State University, I'm getting my master's in medical education and I'm, I'm in my second year. Great. Uh, Asma. Oh, you're muted, I think. Sorry for that. Uh, hello, everyone. So my name is Asma. Um, I'm originally from Egypt and I studied medicine in uh, Mansoura University, which is um, in the um, like north of Egypt. Uh, so, um, and I'm here uh, to do my PhD in biomedical sciences. Great. Uh, Josh. <laughs> Can't hear you. You're not muted. Yeah. Barely. Okay, I'm John Josh Kudipan. I am a fourth year senior student at Ohio State. Um, I'm majoring in Japanese and world economy and business. Uh, I was supposed to be in San this entire year, actually, at our international university in Tokyo. But I am uh, related to the coronavirus, and I am in the process of applying to the Japanese transportation program, as well as grad school. Okay. Kind of got half of it. You were supposed to go to Japan. You're an Ohio State student. Okay. <laughs> um, Justin. Hi, everyone. My name is Justin Tong. Although I'm still a senior student, which is an undergraduate student here, but I, you know, being brought up in China, we have very extensive knowledge about what the Chinese education system is. And I've studied in the Chinese Foreign Affairs University in the summer of 2019. And I in here at the Ohio State University, I study international relations and diplomacy with a minor in economics. Okay, great. 
So for our first question, we're going to direct it for kind of the international students and just ask you to tell us a little bit about um, your university experience. You know, what is life like on your campuses and what do you think is different from kind of your universities and Ohio State or what do you think might be different if you haven't had a chance to get here yet? Speak at will. I can kick us off. Um, so I'm from Germany and I got both my um, undergrad education and my master's there. And um, the universities in Germany are very much academics focused. There is not a lot going on in terms of student life, um, as I can see it here in the US. Um, there are like a bunch of mini clubs and maybe a theater group and maybe a, a tandem group or things like that. But um, you really kind of just go there to take your classes and then go home again. And then in terms of like, hobbies or outside life it's really up to you and it's really kind of like more focused on the city you study in um but not so much at the university so that is one of the big differences that i that i noticed that here it's more of a holistic student development whereas in germany it's really university is there to like get your education and academics focused yeah i think um i can sort of piggyback right on what, what Michaela said, because uh, so Macedonia is is in southeastern Europe and uh, I've also gotten certain education in Slovenia and the Netherlands. And what I found very interesting, very curious is that um, in Europe, there's differences between these universities as themselves, but there are vast differences between the European side and then the American side. And I completely want to agree that Europe is more just about the academics. We do have those student organizations and every once in a while there is some events going on, but the majority of the time we're very much focused on you go to school to learn and you know, just, just your academic classes and you don't necessarily learn about life or you don't, you don't, you don't get to know new people. But there was one, one major difference that I noticed. So in here, students tend to pick their classes and they take their classes at their own time. In all of the European universities I've been, I've been taught, uh, there is more a more straight curriculum that we follow. So you essentially have your cohort that you, that you kind of take your classes with. And even though that can be the case here in Ohio State, the majority of the time you have new people from different programs, from different um, courses, and, and you all come together. So that was the, the biggest news to me because when I would sit in my classes, it'd be people from all parts of their education, all different courses, different PhD programs, master's programs, their undergrads sometimes. So there's a lot of diversity, academic diversity within the classes, which was something we didn't have. We all had the same, we were all the same level of our education back in Europe in a way. All right, so tailbacking on that into the academics, you know, what is the academic life like in your home country? Um, and you could talk about, you know, what the class size is like or what types of relationships you might develop with your professors or academic advisors if you have them. Um, you know, what it's like in class. Do you, are you often encouraged to speak or do you just like sit back and listen? Um, how many classes you have to choose from those types of ideas? In the case of my home country in Ecuador, um, um, it's very different. It's very different from here. I think that it's more similar like what Michaela and Goran just explained that uh, we are just focused on academics, mostly focused on academics. And then the few student organizations that are there are usually also focused on academics, like I don't know, a robotics club or something. Since it was a very technical education that we had, so most of the student orgs were related to that. Um, related to the class sizes and so on, um, the university was mostly limited by the spaces at the university. So since the classes weren't too big, I think that the biggest class that I had there had maybe 40 students because there were um, the capability of the classrooms didn't allow for more students there. Um, and also the relationship between professors and students is completely different, completely different there. Uh, we have more of a passive education, if I'd say. You are not very 
encouraged to ask questions. I mean, th there are certain exceptions, of course, as in everything, but it's not like the general core of the education to, to let you ask questions or, or to encourage people to ask questions, but it's mostly to receive the theory and to receive the exercises and to think about it and work on your own. So, and basically that, that's one of the differences uh, with here, here it's much, much the, much the opposite. Well, I think speaking from a Chinese perspective, you're, if you are speaking about a country that has 1.4 billion population in terms of class sizes, it's going to be huge. It's going to be very big. So uh, in a lot of classes, it's no, it's no uncommon that, you know, the class size can be 200, 300 people, especially uh, in, in sense of the GE classes in the United States. And there's GE classes in China and, and the take into consideration of that huge population and the class size will be very huge in some kind of uh, G classes. And uh, for the uh, professors, and I just uh, resonate with, with what Linda just said, the Chinese education system is not, it's completely different from the American education system. The teachers instruct and the student getting educated and listen. So that is the dynamic between the professors and the students. The professors go into the classroom and he or she just basically starts teaching and just pouring the information to the students and students just sit and getting educated. And it's very uncommon. It, it, it's not just, un, um, it's not uncommon, but it's very uh, strange for a student to raise his or her hand in a class of 200, 300 people because professor only have 50 an hour to teach that many students that much knowledge. So you're not encouraged to talk freely in class until the professor instructed you to do so. And uh, in terms of approaching the professors after class, and I studied in China's Foreign Affairs University, which is a very dis uh, disciplined uh, university, which they're uh, preparing the next diplomats of the China. And when I approach a professor, he seemed rather surprised that I approached because he's a very renowned scholar in Chinese academics. And I can feel that he sometimes feel a little bit uncomfortable talking to students after class, which I think that is basically the, the dynamic of the professor and student relations in China. You respect your teacher, you getting educated from listening to the teacher. And if you have question, you're gonna ask it in a, in a, in a uh, respectful and less uh, bothering way, I guess. It's just like th this dynamic is, is very common in China. So um, yeah, I would uh, I would like to share my experience in uh, like in academic life in Egypt. So um, yeah, uh, it's similar to what you said about China. The class size is the, is really big, um, maybe because we don't have as many universities as in um, like in USA. Uh, so the class size can be uh, like 500 uh, in in one class. So we have bigger like like. Um, uh, very very big lectures which have like the, the whole like the whole class in it and then we have the smaller groups um, um, uh, regarding the, the relationship with, between the students and the professors it's very formal so yeah uh, uh, it's not it's not very usual to approach uh, the professor especially the, the like the the, prof the I, I would say the the very um, uh, like older, it, like uh, older ones, uh, it's not usual, and it. Uh, I think it's it's personally. Uh, it depends on the on, on the uh, personal, like uh, the. Uh, I would say that it, it's it difference from one professor to uh, to another. Um, so you are not encouraged to ask questions because of the big class size and uh, and the limited time. Um, uh, I think we have some uh, student organizations, which is mainly focused on the academic, um, like uh, academic life. We don't have like a lot of extracurricular and like um, event, uh, like uh, extracurricular activities or uh, outside of academia life. Uh, we don't have it in uh, usually uh, in Egypt. So, um, if I may. Um... I, I kind of want to contrast a little bit, especially when it comes to uh, relationships of, of students and professors 
And um, I can contrast what it's like in the US versus Macedonia and the US versus the Netherlands in this case, because um, I've, I've gotten a research exchange at the Erasmus University in Rotterdam. Um, I think regarding class size, it, at least in, on the European side, it very much varies as to what is the purpose of that class. So we would have those big lecture classes, like the auditorium classes of 100 students, if that is sort of the purpose of that particular class. But whenever we need to speak more, whenever we need to do something, then we are in small groups. So in Macedonia, I've had classes of five students. I've had classes of 100 students. No more than 100, though, because it's a 2 million people countries so we we're two millions so it's, it's a small country by default uh and the differences was macedonia we were taught in macedonia so it's it's a language where you've had you've had more people from the country right not a lot of foreign students but as opposed to that in the netherlands we literally had a person from every part of the world every country almost sometimes and uh, when it comes to student professor relationships i feel like here in america you can you, you're encouraged to speak up. You can you can speak freely with the professors and have a certain level of of a professional relationship. In Macedonia, on the other hand, it was very strict in a way, and there was this great divide between professors and students. But you you think this is still Europe, so you you're welcome to ask questions or welcome to stay after class and and, and ask the professor something regardless of their age. So professors were communicative, but there's this super formal relationship where you would never go off on a tangent and start talking about your life, for example, or make a joke. You just talk about the academics because that's what you need to do. And then there's this completely flipped 180 degrees in the Netherlands where students during class are encouraged to speak. If anyone had the pleasure to be in the Netherlands and talk to Dutch people, very well outspoken, and I kind of learned how to do that from them. People would even challenge views during the lecture. They would talk to the professor and say, well, I completely disagree. I don't know where this is from, and I want to learn about this more. But there were times when we would, as a group, so this was never one-on-one, -on -one, but as a group, we would take the professor, so they would take us, and we would go grab a beer together or something, because our relationship with, you know, having a bar on campus is in Europe is a little bit different than here. So this would be obviously after classes and stuff, but we would have that moment where you just grab a drink. While in here, I've, it hasn't been the case, but I've only had seven months of normal US experience, <laughs> but it never happened though, so far. Okay. So kind of switching gears from the academics to kind of the home life, you know, what is it like um, in terms of the living arrangements in your countries, do students live in dorms on campuses? Do they stay at homes? It's, you know, at home, not at homes. Um, do they live in apartments off campus? Kind of what is that dynamic? Well, for my country, it is very, very much like depends on uh, different students because again if you take into consideration of the population and the mass campus size you cannot accommodate every student on campus i mean they're basically in chinese university there is boarding universities which basically every student stay on campus and they uh, share six person per room in the in the uh, residence hall but there is a considerable large amount of students live off campus in the apartments near the university and uh, and that the housing price in China is surprisingly a lot cheaper than the United States, so that that is much more affordable to a lot of students to live off campus and they can share apartments. And I think that is, and I, I think that's basically day to day life to the Chinese students. They uh, they do not participate in a lot of club club affairs. They basically just study like a, for a lot of time. They play sports, and that is basically. Uh, student life of the Chinese students. In Germany, um, we do have dorms, but they're not necessarily affiliated with the university. So they're not controlled by the university and they're also not on campus. They're like spread out over the whole city. And um, the dorms are very popular and you actually have to apply, like you have to fill out a whole application, you have to let a letter of motivation and like send in your CV, it's like a job application. And they're very popular because they're cheaper, um, but they cannot accommodate all students. So I would say the majority actually lives in privately um, rented apartments. They usually sh they're usually shared with other people. Um, so it's, 
interesting dynamic because a dorm is kind of like a like a town of itself like usually there's a little shop there's usually a bar like you said it's a new and um, a lot of student life um, that doesn't happen on campus happens in the dorms. Like there's different clubs, there's different movie nights, or we had a choir, we had a band, but it was like in the dorm and there was a huge community within the dorm. In my country, it's very different. And I actually learned about dorms here because we don't have the concept of dorms back at home. So it, it's a bit surprising, yeah. So most of the universities, the universities are not so big. And uh, usually it's expected that the student will accommodate himself in the university. I think that just the last 10 years is that the universities have encouraged to have more people from other cities. But it, it was usually the case that most of the people that were studying at the university were living in that particular city. So, for example, um, in my university, since it was in the capital of the of the country, then we tend to receive a lot of students from other cities in the country. However, they are expected to accommodate themselves. So I think that that's something that is failing a bit because it's not that the university does any work really uh, when trying to accommodate the incoming students, so not even with information. So it's usually more with uh, friends or friends of your family or so that know someone in the city or something uh, uh, that the students are expected to accommodate themselves. And of course, there are a lot of privately owned apartments and rooms around the campus, but it's <clears throat> not related at all with the, uni the university doesn't have any say in that and doesn't really uh, yeah, that's doesn't really participate in accommodation at all. And then when um, students in Egypt... Oh, sorry. Sorry. No, go ahead. <clears throat> okay. Uh, so um, in Egypt, since we have uh, one university or a uh, university um, uh, in, in every big city, um, like uh, people would uh, would prefer to go to the university that's uh, closest to the uh, to their town, uh, like uh, their home uh, city or hometown. So they would um, live with their parents and then go to the university that is uh, close, so they don't have to live in dorms or um, they don't have to travel. Uh, I would say out of their um, city or town. Uh, but there is dorm for uh, for the students that are uh, um, like. Uh, from outside the, the, the city, um, but it cannot accommodate all, all the students. So uh, some students would have to uh, live on their own outside the dorms. I would say that the dorms are not the, like the, the perfect housing for students because it's very economic, um, uh, maybe sometimes crowded. So uh, a lot of students would prefer to live um, outside of the university dorms. So with the students that are living in apartments and Josh might be able to speak to what some of this is like at Ohio State, but I know we have like um, apartments that are specifically geared towards students and they can be quite luxurious with pools and gyms and they're nicer than what like I could afford as a working professional. Um, you know, are most students in your country's kind of living um, and just whatever apartment is available throughout the city, or do you have those kind of apartments geared specifically towards like whole unit or like residents for students? And, and Josh, if you want to talk a little bit about what those are like here in the U.S., please chime in. Still not hearing you. Or, or maybe not. Yeah. Josh, maybe you could unplug the headphones. I don't know if that would, if that's possible, if that would help. Sound better? So you, I can hear you better. There's just a lot of background noise when you talk. Okay. Um, come back to me in like two minutes. Let me, let me mess with some things. Oh, okay. Yeah, that was better though. So next time I think you'll be good to go. 
And how about in Japan, Canon? Do you guys usually live kind of on or near campus? Do you live at home? Um, in Japan, it's not common to live at home. Um, students often go to the campus by train and it takes one hour average. So um, we commute by train. <laughs> Great. All right. So thank well, you then comment. about. Oh. Oh, sorry, uh, Elizabeth. No, it was just a note on what you just mentioned regarding the luxurious apartments here in Colombo. I'm yes. also living here in Columbus. So, um, <laughs> Yeah, I will, I will also see them um, and surprised by the prices of rent and so, but I think that it makes sense here specifically because of the prices, because, for example, back at home, the, the apartments or the rooms that are geared towards students, they are very cheap. They are very, very cheap, much cheap, cheaper than what a family uh, would pay, for example, for rent, but they are also really humble places. They are really simple places, small places and so. Uh, but here what I see is that the dorms, they, they are not big at the university. They are not big and they are very expensive. So of course, when students are presented with another opportunity that is as expensive, but better, bigger, uh, or more luxurious, they're gonna take it. So I think that that's where it, it makes sense. Because mm -hmm. back at home, yeah, of course, it's, it, it's super cheap uh, to live as a student. I mean, you can find places that are very cheap. So I think that maybe there's uh, when there's one big difference. Well, can I add one more thing from that? Yeah. yeah. So uh, if we are talking about the housing accommodation in China, which I think there has to be, I have to make this very clear that uh, every city in, in China is basically like the, the, in terms of the demographics of its housing, it's basically like New York City. It's, it's, it's not that in, in house they allow students, like five, six students share a house, this house are living is shared by two. There's no sense of shared house in China because China has no place for house. And in China, what you will see is often 10 story or 20 story, even 30 story buildings around campus because of the mass population. So they have to live like in all those like tall buildings like the New York City. So basically, no matter which city you go, what you, whatever new, uh, university you study in China, especially in Shanghai, Beijing, those mega uh, major cities, you're expected to live in those like tall buildings and share apartment with others. And you, if you are financially stable, you can share the apartment with yourself. And surprisingly, even in Shanghai near, uh, I'll just use Beijing, which is one of the most expensive city yeah, uh, in China. If you live camp near to the campus with another roommate and you share a decent size apartment, it will only cost you about like three to four hundred dollars per month live in the capital of China studying the universities. While here in Columbus, this house costs me eight hundred dollars a month to live in. So that is a surprisingly huge contrast in terms of price between the United States and China and uh, the living styles, there's basically no house to live in China. Okay. So we've talked a little bit about um, student organizations and that part of campus life and seems like something that's maybe more prevalent here in the US. Um, but do you want to touch on that a little bit more and maybe Josh, you can try and chime in again with all of the variety, very large variety of options um, at Ohio State. Can try and start off. Is it better at all? Yeah, that's much better. Yeah. Okay. I really discuss the audio issues. Um, yeah, so student life at Ohio State. Um, and there's like a lot of different tracks you can do it too. There's not only just a wide variety of clubs, like hundreds of clubs here at OSU that we like have, um, but there are different kind. So there are some that are like a track you apply to get into. Um, uh, what I was part of was like a, this scholars organization called Mountain Leadership Scholars. And so as like an uh, applicant to Ohio State, I applied to join the scholars organization where we live in our community together and then we would do take out all these um, tasks and all these jobs. Uh, we would have like this thing called the Legacy Week Freshman Year where we divided up in teams and then Totally different social issues in 
uh, Columbus, uh, one of them being that, you know, we had a women's hygiene drive or another, like, one was that we had a Valentine's Day festival for kids in a, a home. Um, so that was a really, really important organization to my time here at Ohio State. Um, that's where I developed a lot of my friends and my community here. But then inside of that, there's just so many you can do and make. I also live with um, one of my roommates. He actually um, started a club called Mental Health Matters here at Ohio State. And he's the, he's been the uh, captain, CEO, leader of this club ever since he started it sophomore year. Uh, it was two years ago here. Um, and it's really cool. He, he wanted to develop a, a club that was specifically to help students bring each other up uh, and talk, be like more freely talk about their mental health issues, which he hadn't found here at Ohio State. So he was able to make one without really any hindrance at all, um, which is really cool, uh, in my opinion. Is that possible at other universities to kind of develop your own clubs? Um, yes and no. So um, there are a couple of clubs at my university. I think the biggest problem is um, visibility because there is no office that kind of brings them all together. Um, so there is no fair or anything like that. They're kind of hidden. So. Um, I personally am very interested in theater, but I had to like actively look for a theater group because there was like no ads for it. And um, I know a friend of mine um, randomly joined the um, radio club because he saw a sticker in the bathroom. Like there was just these like little places where you could maybe find a club, but there was like no active promotion by the university to actually make them visible. Um, you can start your own club, um, that for sure you would never get any funding or anything like that. You just be your club and find a couple of friends. Um, yeah, but I think the biggest problem is there's no visibility and then people don't even think about joining a club or uh, founding a club because it's just not part of your everyday life at the university. Um, so I First of all, I just want to say it's it's very interesting and I love the fact that when I'm in Europe, there's these huge differences among universities, but now being here, you know, hearing Kayla share her experiences, they're so similar to mine. So from a distance, Europe looks way more homogeneous than it actually is. But on the question of student organizations, so maybe this was very uh, typical for the medical world, for the medical schools around Europe. But for me, this was the same experience in the three countries, so Macedonia, Slovenia, and, and the Netherlands regarding student organizations. So it was difficult to officially register a student org. It was possible, but as Michaela said, you're not, not getting funding if you just kind of spontaneously decide to create a student organization. However, what we did most of the time is all of our medical students organizations were tied first from from our local universities they were tied to the national organization and we always had a national one and that national was always part of an umbrella international organization so we have the European Medical Students Association just for Europe and we had IFMSA which is the International Federation for Medical Students Associations so we were always you know part of something bigger in a way and within these universities so within the medical faculty if somebody wanted to do something like for example a mental health project or any project of other type they would come within the organization so all of these organizations had their own pillars or subgroups or teams within the larger organization and you can always come and create something new you know so if, if it's a medical organization and you're interested in public health there's public health group and people who do that so you can go with them register a new project or something new but it's still within the funding of this larger organization and although we never had like an official fair for all the organizations because it was usually two or three per per university you they always had like an open day and they always happen at different times, but they would be announced on social media and stuff. Yeah. Okay. So how about sports? Because if you've paid any attention at all to Ohio State, we are very, um, you know, big into our sports. We like our football and everything else. Um, so how does sports play a role in your various um, universities? Is it 
a thing? Is it more clubs? Is it just not a thing at all? Well, I think in terms of sports, uh, first of all, nobody in China plays football or American football. They do play European soccer, which is very popular in China. And uh, I think basketball, ping pong, badminton, tennis, uh, soccer are five major sports of all Chinese universities. And there is a huge, huge amount of uh, especially male college students, they participate in different uh, sports clubs like vigorously. Like they, uh, besides study, for most of them after the study, after they finish the study at 5 p.m., what they do is uh, play uh, play uh, soccer and basketball with each other and then go to the uh, restaurants and then study in the evening. So sports do play a tremendous important role in everyday Chinese students' life. And I think there has been a very uh, flourishing environment of uh, sports. And uh, surprisingly, to my surprise, a lot of even the majority of the Chinese universities, they're encouraging students to set up sports uh, clubs and they're encouraging students to play sports because they also realize how stressful you know being a student in China is and sports can be a very good relief for you know stress from studying. Um, in my country, I would say that in the universities, it's usually more like student-led organizations the one that, uh, for sports than, than the university itself. But I think that um, there's a very good complement uh, between the student organizations that plan sports and the university. In my university specifically, um, well, soccer is really big in Latin America, I think. So it's really big in, in my country as well. So I would say that the, the biggest focus is in soccer. So if you have a group of friends, you can make a team, you can form a team, and then the university, usually each faculty organizes like an intramural competition and then you can play if you win within your faculty or so then you can play in like a whole university in Bramural as well. I think that Ohio State that does something similar uh, but uh, yeah, in my country that's organized by students um, then there's also a version of volleyball that is very popular in my country is called Equa Volley, Equa because of Ecuador. So that's also a very popular sport then also basketball in a lesser, to a lesser extent. So I would say that it's uh, similar as, was, as, what, as what Justin just mentioned. So uh, people were usually very eager to finish classes and then to go play soccer in the field or so, just throw a ball or play ping pong in the student organization or so. There is not so much structure as here because here I see a lot of structure in everything, like in student organizations, in sports, in everything. There's not so much structure there, but it's more of an spontaneous expression of the students themselves um, after classes or so. And also, I think in terms of national attention of sports, surprisingly, in the United States, is predominantly American football. And you can see every major universities, every major TV stations, they're like paying that massive attention to football during football seasons, which I do not think that applies to any other countries. And even though sports is very, very popular in China, even though soccer is in the badminton, basketball, it, it's less national, but that really belongs to different universities, belongs to the students. There isn't that sense of national attention on sports uh, compared to the United States. A whole focus on American football is something that I feel like is ingrained in a lot of Americans, even from like a childhood, right? Because you grow up, even as like a middle school, which is like your uh, like 11 to 13, everyone's watching the middle school football team. And so then it's the same thing in high school, you know, uh, primary school and all the way through college. It's just like, a, it, I, I don't know why. A lot of people that go to the games aren't even big football fans or don't like the sport. It's just the, uh, the culture, I guess. Do you guys have any questions for each other about what life is like and wherever they have been? your home countries? Yeah, I would like to hear from Canon. sorry. Um, I was in Japan last year because I went for an internship and I was uh, like a, a little longer than two months in Nagoya. 
So I was working at Nagoya University and I found it really interesting how life was there. I, I couldn't experience much life of the university. I was working at a lab. However, I, I wanted to ask about how, how is the student life in Japan usually? Because I saw a lot of students coming in the morning, 8 a.m., through the train, like you said. And then um, there were a lot of people playing sports as well there after classes, like 5 p.m. that I was going to the gym. There are a lot of people playing there. And so how, how is the culture there? How, how does it um, happen? That's curious. Um, in Japan, um, students are joining the organization and as a sports, um, my home university, Waseda University, has the rival university and uh, a baseball. And um, we watch the baseball game in the baseball season. So, and students watch the weather, whether the our university or rival university win. <laughs> okay, and then the last question for you guys, um, how has COVID-19 kind of uh, changed life at your university? Um, do you know, like, is there a lot of changes? Is it just kind of little things? What have you noticed um, over the past six months? Well, I think realize most of you are here, but if you've talked to people at home or friends back there still. Well, I think in terms of China, you know, it, it, it's kind of uh, interesting to talk about the case in China right now because COVID. You know, the first outbreak was in Wuhan, China, and it absolutely, absolutely made a profound impact on uh, China, which basically, you know, close to the end of January, China was basically in a national lockdown, which uh, back then, uh, let me explain a little bit about Chinese culture. So uh, the mo majority of the Chinese universities, the, the uh, autumn semester ends at something in the beginning of January. So during that period, it's like the spring festival of China, which is like Christmas. So students basically go back to their homes, which is often like a thousand miles away or hundred miles away. So they're basically stay home. And 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 at that moment, uh, the COVID nineteen broke out. So the national was uh, so the entire nation was basically locked down. So almost the majority, millions and millions and tens of millions of students are not allowed to going back to the universities and they have been in lockdown for three months. So China uh, 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 lifted the lockdown something sometime in May and when the student returned to the dorm, it was, it was, like, it was like a forest in their dorm because you, know, if you leave your dorm uh, untouched for three months, there's a lot of things gonna happen. So I think, well, I, I'm choosing my words very carefully here because when now in the United States, if you're talking about COVID-19 and China at the same time, you, you have to be very careful of what you're saying. But what I'm trying to say is it has made a profound impact and a lot of sacrifice for the Chinese students from the period of February and May because during those three months, the entire nation was basically in a lockdown. And after China was like successfully suppressed the virus, so they're basically resumed their normal life since May. So uh, my cousin, uh, he studied in one of the uh, universities in Shanghai, and he has to stay, stay in his home for like three months. And after that, in May, they resume the universities and you can return to campus wearing a mask, social distancing, but basically the life was going back to normal. Unlike here in the United States, we still have to you know, meet in person Zoom. And here in China, basically most universities have resumed their class and meet in person. So that's a huge difference. Yeah, Germany was very interesting. Um, similar to what Justin just mentioned, our semesters are, our semester times are just completely different. Our fall term starts in October and goes into February. And then our summer term starts in April and goes until July. So Germany went into a lockdown in March 
and a lot of universities postponed their the start of the semester actually thinking <laughs> COVID's going to be over in two weeks <laughs> but then they also had to just move everything online and the entire summer term was online and then actually we lifted the lockdown I believe in like June or July or something like that and um, we kind of had things under control so they were planning on having the um, fall term like hybrid or in person even and then they because they postponed the summer term they also postponed the winter term so it was supposed to start in the middle of October but it actually started last week beginning of November which coincided with the second lockdown. So kind of the same thing happened again. They were planning for an in-person semester and then the COVID numbers just got worse and worse and were kind of through the roof. So now they like spontaneously moved online again. Like for some reason they managed to like coincide it with um, the wave, even though they had it under control for a very long time. So everything's back to online again. Um, uh, back at home is something no, well, not not so similar. Uh, Ecuador also entered the lockdown in mid March. I think that it was a strict lockdown until June. So it was so strict that it had even a curfew. So you just could go out until 2 p.m. And then you had to be home from then. So all the universities, at least the public universities, they didn't have much trouble moving online. I think that it was harder for the private universities because you have to pay for them. So students were complaining that if they are not going to be there, why would they pay? Like similar, I think that here in the US something similar happened. So I, I have one cousin that is studying at my university. So I lived firsthand experience through his experience. So they moved everything online. Um, they were also the dates are a bit shifted. So I think that when they entered the lockdown, they were starting the semester. They finished the semester around July, I think. Uh, well, they had to delay the start of the semester by a month to move to try to move everything online. But of course, you have also the problems in here, like the inherent inherent problems uh, in the society. Like in Ecuador, you don't have really large connectivity among people and uh, mainly in public universities you don't have people that have resources to really be connected online the whole day so that was a really big problem and uh, that supposed that uh, that it would just increase the gap between people that have more resources than others so even in universities uh, it, it seemed to most of the population that most of the universities didn't do enough to try to connect all of their students so suddenly all the enrollment rates just dropped enormously because there was no option for people uh, for example there were people that are moving from indigenous communities to study in the university in the big city they had to go back to their small communities they don't have internet because they barely have electricity for some parts of the day so just imagine how hard that must be uh, but yeah anyway they did it they finished that semester and then uh, right now i think that they finished the second semester it was fully online and of course with all the challenges that it supposes to students and to professors because even for professors it it, it is hard sometimes uh, so yeah, uh, that, that's the current climate there. I don't know if it's going to change. They are still deciding what they are going to do for the next semester. I know that some of the, um, at least the research labs, the, the professors, they are going back to the lab to study. They have to get some special permits, uh, but it's very hard. Even, even the transportation is very hard because there are some restrictions of transportation. Depending on the last number on your plate, then you are allowed or not allowed to go out. So if you have a car that ends in zero, you can just go out four days a week. That's like Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So if you had to work on Tuesday and Thursday, th there's no way that you can do it using your car or so. So th these are like other, other challenges that also support this situation supposes that we don't know how long it would take. Right now we are seeing a second wave in Europe but I'm not sure if the first wave is over here or in my country. So yeah, we're, we're, we're waiting. And uh, 
if I say something more, so uh, I have a lot of uh, friends uh, that are in, in universities in China, which we basically communicate on WeChat. That, 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 that is another con controversial topic, but basically uh, the WeChat is just like Instagram, they post their day-to-day -day life, or like Snapchat, they post their day-to-day -day life on their social media. And I, being in Columbus, Ohio, being in the United States, look at all my friends or a lot of my friends in Shanghai, in Beijing, different cities in China, they're posting about what their life is. And I was surprised that how normal, like their life has been in China at this moment. They just go to class in person, basically without any mask and that they go to the restaurant together, share like a, 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 a dishes together. They go to hot pot together, they go to movies together, they, they go to bars together. And that, that was something that is kind of uh, you shouldn't do here in the United States. And uh, what makes me kind of like feel conflicted is that I study in the United States, which is the most strongest, uh, the strongest country and the most democratic country in this world, which people have this uh, perception about the United States that as the most, uh, as the strongest and most democratic country in this world is supposed to do better than other countries. It's supposed to lead by example uh, of other countries. It's supposed to be the beacon of everything that the, the entire world is look up to. But now just like looking at this contrast and if you are taking to the communist, communist regime of China, which people, people often think that that's an evil symbol and then which makes people think that in a country such as communist regime China, they should do less better than the United States. But now here, just being a Chinese student in the United States, looking at my friends, the this, this situation of their life, completely normal in China, and then being in the United States, it's just so, I, I'm just, I'm sometimes even speechless that how the United States has gotten to this step. And yesterday was just past 10 million cases. It was just shocking. Wonderful. Thank you all for sharing your, your thoughts. And I think Caroline's got a couple things to uh, wrap up. Sure. Yeah. Well, thank you all for, for all of your contributions um, to, to end. And this is really for the benefit mostly of the people who will be watching this, um, but certainly for you all as well. Um, I have a few slides to wrap up. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. Um, get the slideshow going here. Let me know if you're not able to see this. So, um, you know, we know that it is hard to actually make it abroad right now, whether you're an international student who wants to go home or a domestic student who would like to study abroad. Um, so traveling is tough right now, um, but at OIA, we're trying to still think of new creative ways to, as our slogan is, know and engage the world um, with OIA. So just to highlight a couple of our programs. Um, so for education abroad, and Elizabeth could speak to this, um, more thoroughly than I could being on the Ed Abroad team, um, but they are still hosting lots and lots of events. Um, what you are a part of today is the Buckeye Bridge series, um, virtual events meant to bring the world uh, to you. Um, there are also lots of getting started sessions being held to explore the basics of education abroad. Um, and if you are thinking about further travel, um, there are lots of web resources available um, to look into everything that's offered through Ohio State. Um, I work on OIA's global engagement team, and we also have quite a lot of programming still happening in our virtual environment. Um, really, our goal primarily is to bring together international and domestic students for conversations like this. Um, so just there are some examples of our programs there. Every Tuesday night at six o'clock, we have Global Engagement Night, which also has lots of conversations on different topics with international and domestic students. 
Uh, we have an international film series, an English conversation program. Um, speed friending is a fun event um, that we offer every week. Um, and we also have things like trips off campus. Those are not happening right now, unfortunately, but we will resume them when we're able. Um, we take trips um, to other cities around the US and to other places in Ohio um, so that students can experience the culture outside Columbus. We also have a new global engagement certificate program where if students attend a certain number of our programs and complete certain um, certain requirements, they can earn a certificate in global engagement from OIA. So um, I believe, um, yes, if anyone has any questions about our programs, um, certainly you can ask them. And um, I put our the um, Education Abroad and the International Students and Scholars email addresses there. So I will um, stop my screen share. Um, so thank you all so much for, for joining us this morning. I think this was a really great conversation. I know I learned a lot. I'm sure the people who watch this will also um, get a lot out of it. Um, so, so thank you so much again.